You ever just have like this thing in you that just you want something for people? You just, man. I want to be that church that wants something for you, not something from you. I want to be that pastor that wants something for you, not something from you. I have this, I'm just, every day it gets a little clearer. I begin to see that, that following Jesus, being a Christian, but I, hate, I almost hate to say it because when people say being a Christian, they got, they've got baggage attached to the word Christian, and they don't really have any idea what that means. And, and I, I know, I know that the power of God can change your life. I mean, can, can make you into something you couldn't believe, you would never believe is possible for you. I, I'm, I'm just tired, I'm tired of a Christianity that leaves you begging. I, I mean, you, you live your whole life just trying not to mess up. You know, you know it's just, being a Christian is not about trying not to sin. That's annoying to me. That's annoying to me. <laughs> Being a Christian is about transforming the world in which you live. It really is. And it doesn't come by stressing yourself out and working really hard. It actually comes through rest. So we're talking about this theological concept. It sounds like a big word. I'm using it because most evangelicals have never heard it, so now I get to define it. If you listen to me long enough, you realize I do that often. I avoid words with baggage when I can. I can't always do it. But here's this word, this ancient theological word called theosis. And it means that we become by grace all that God is by nature. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow! I mean, really, dig into that for a minute. We become by grace all that God is by nature? I think you're reaching for the stars there, Michael. Think you're getting out of the realm of possibilities. Yo, you think it's impossible, huh? I, I happen to know this guy who said that with God, there are no impossibilities. Nothing is impossible for God. And if you believe in Jesus, guess where God lives? In you. You're a temple of the presence of of God. God inhabits you. And I know some of you are sitting there going, well, yeah, he hasn't really done the stuff I've asked him to do lately. Maybe he did what you needed and not what you wanted, but we can get back to that. So this series is about how to, how to theosis, and I'm totally using the word wrong, but it's ear-catching. How to, how to move into a place where your faith organically and naturally and powerfully emerges out of your spirit and your being rather than all of this it, 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 it another thing that annoys me is you go to church they take you through their ritual whatever it is their liturgy which is fine but then they give you a new law so we're talking i want to lay a foundation of where theosis begins this transformation from that emptiness that you feel, that aloneness, that brokenness, that inadequacy, that mistakenness about you? How do we get from that to a place of actually living in power as a believer? A place where we're actually, we're transforming our lives, our families, our workplaces, our community. How do we get from this place where I'm powerless to this place where I'm a son of God? And now nothing's impossible. And so I want to lay a foundation for that. And we start in this thing called stillness. By this love is perfected in us, 1 John 4, 17. So that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because just as Jesus is, just as Jesus is, that sounds present tense to me. It sounds like it's about Jesus. We talked about him. We sang about him just a second ago. Just as Jesus is, so also are we in the world. I didn't write this. Okay? This is a couple thousand years old. This is not a new idea. Just as Jesus is, so are you in your world. 
That's where we're beginning with this notion of theosis. And so I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus had a plan. And that plan was not a new law. That plan was not, okay, I died on a cross to make it possible for you to get to God and then live the rest of your life trying to stay out of trouble with him. That's the average view of religion right there. It's really challenging for us as Western thinkers, and I don't mean Western like the West United States. I mean Western thinkers like Europe, United States, these Western-minded, Greco-Roman, segmented thinking. It's really difficult for us to understand Jesus' plan because we think of things in boxes, especially men. We men are terrible at it. And so we, we think, you know, here's our church box, and here's my work box, and here's my fun box, and here's my nothing box, and let's go back to my nothing box. And we think of the world that way, but that is not how Jesus thought, that's not how Hebrews think, or the Jewish people thought, that's not how the Bible was written. The people who wrote the Bible did not have colonized or segmented thinking like that. They saw it all as holistic, all as connected. They did not have a spiritual life and a secular life. They just, everything was spiritual, whether it was spiritual or secular or not. And so when Jesus, when God has this plan, and his plan is not just to to send missionaries throughout the world. His plan was to actually send his son everywhere. Jesus everywhere. Think about it. Jesus comes to earth. He lives for 33 years. He's in ministry for three and a half years. He does awesome stuff for that three and a half years. Ministers to people. And he dies on a cross and he changes the world. Some of you may have wondered, well, why didn't Jesus just come immediately back and then stand and build a huge ministry? Because that wasn't the plan. The plan was to actually infect the world with Jesus. The plan was to have the Jesus virus infect every person. And so this, per, this, this, this person nature of God, Jesus, would inhabit people, and then those people would work, go wherever they went, to work, to America, to South America, missionaries, wherever they go, and they would carry the Jesus virus with them. They would bring Jesus with them wherever they went. So what Jesus did by dying on the cross and rising from the dead and seeing the Holy Spirit is he turned one problem for the enemy into billions of problems. For the enemy so that was God's plan and here's what I've been learning lately and it's just got my head flipped upside down and it looks funny in the mirror Jesus is what God believes about you what a notion what a notion to think about this that when God looks at you I know you're probably okay with language that says when God looks at you he sees the Son. And you probably think in that, you're like, well, yeah, of course, because Jesus is awesome and I'm not. But what you don't realize is that you were actually created to be awesome. God's intent for you is to be awesome. You are in the image of God. Do you realize what that means? You are in the image of God. Theosis happens not by me trying to get more of God and me trying to be better and me trying to be righteous. By the way, you can never achieve righteousness through behavior. Righteousness begins in the heart and it must be born of pure agape love, unconditional love. If it's not born, of, if it's selfish in any way, it stops being righteousness and it stops being love. You are God's plan to reach this city, your workplace, your family, your kids. You are the plan. Jesus had a plan. You're the plan. And the plan is that Jesus lives in you, and you begin to act like, live like, move like, think like, talk like Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Now that's the text that needs to be driving Christianity today. Not the text that's, that's sin conscious and keep just, just stay out of trouble with God. He's just dying to get you. He's ready to judge you. This is the text that needs to say, hey, you are not living up to your potential. You have God in you, and you are living like you have a slug in you. Oh, that was gross. I should not have said that. <sighs> Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. 
Now, I know why you struggle with that. But just because you struggle with it doesn't make it untrue. Amen. Your struggles and your circumstances do not negate the teachings of Jesus. Do you understand? Your life has contradictions to this teaching, and those contradictions are lies. You need to embrace this reality, man. Because this is how faith thinks. This is what metanoia is about. Metanoia is about changing my thinking from a place of the impossible to the place of possibilities. And Jesus says there are possibilities. So Jesus' life demonstrated what, what faith looks like. What it is to live by faith. Jesus understood his potential. <laughs> be still and know that I'm God. I will be honored by every nation. I'll be honored throughout the world. <laughs> be still. So we move from this reality of what's wrong with me, what's wrong in the world. And here God is saying to us, okay, breathe, be still, because I am. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul. What Peter's telling you is there are things that the world thinks are rest, are good for you, are what you want, should be goals. They're, but they're not those things at all. They actually further inflict damage upon the soul. So we have to look to the things that actually make us safe, actually heal our bodies. You know, I, I have definitely struggled with anxiety and depression many times. And, you know, I've tried things, distracting things. Uh, here's the thing that works for me. And I know you're going to, I know what you're going to, as soon as I say you're going to go, well, yeah, you're the pastor, you're supposed to say that. Worship. Worship works. Worship works. When I stop stillness and I look at the Father, I experience His nature. And his nature changes my nature. Does that make sense? I love, I love worship. By the way, here's how I define worship. We inhabit a moment with the divine. So what is stillness? <clears throat> if, it's not, if it's not neglect, if it's not avoidance, if it's not... Stillness is when we stop the chaos of our mind. We put the brakes on the echo chamber that needs to be quieted. Okay. I'm not trying to overload you, but I, you have this, this echo chamber in your head. And in that echo chamber, things that get said to you, most of these are things that are said verbally. And they're usually the worst things that have been said. They go into this chamber and they start bouncing around. And as you live longer, more things get said, more accusations happen, more slights, more abuses, more accusations, on and on it goes, and they just keep getting added to the echo chamber. And this is why we can't handle stillness and quiet, because as soon as we set our phone down and we say, I'm not looking at that anymore, all of a sudden, we actually start to experience emotional pain. Because the echo chamber is still spinning. You're a loser. You're a failure. Remember when you did this? Blah, 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 blah. On and on it goes. Okay. Here's the thing, though. I understand the echo chamber. But here's what ticks me off about it. <laughs> as a Christian, as a, as a believer, as someone who's turned to Christ, you're starting to think differently now. You're inhabited by Jesus. Inhabited inhabited like he lives in you okay so the voice of the darkness is out here and the voice of the light is in here how is it that the voice of the darkness can speak louder than the voice that inhabits me why isn't the voice that inhabits me louder than the spirit that oppresses me jesus is in you and he is speaking to you I know what it's like to walk around in life and you're like, I don't think, I, I can't hear from God right now. That's not what's happening. It's, you can't hear from God. It's not because God has gone silent. It's not because you're in trouble. Right. You can't get in trouble. All your trouble's on Jesus. Right. Okay? It, it, 
And so you have the voice of Jesus within you, and he's talking to you. Stillness is when I shut down the echo chamber. And I go into my closet, this one in here. The place where the Spirit is. The place where Jesus lives in me. And I begin to listen to him and his truth. And maybe I read the Bible and I get the scriptures and I let the scriptures, I let Jesus that's in me give voice to the scriptures that I read or listen to. And by the way, that's the only way you will ever connect with the Word of God in an honest way. You have to have Jesus. The Holy Spirit has to reveal scriptures to you. Your intellect and logic alone cannot do it. Now, I'm not saying they're unnecessary. I'm just saying they can't do it alone. The Spirit is the only thing that can make the Word of God actually the Word of God. Too much of modern Christianity is academic only. If you can't apply it, you don't know it. So stillness is about quieting the chaos in the echo chamber, shutting down that darkness, listening to Jesus Christ, tapping into scriptures, and then responding. You see, becoming all that God is by nature, by grace, becoming by grace, all that God is by nature. It begins with a place of stillness. We rest in our Father and we begin to see who we're meant to be. We begin to know what God knows about us. And begin to walk in some things that are not empty anymore. You want to be free of sin? You want to walk and live in righteousness as you've been, if you've been in church long, you've heard your whole life? The answer is not trying to be righteous and trying not to sin. The answer is to turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Because that's how you're transformed according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's how you're transformed from glory to glory. Not through effort through focus. You learn how to rest in the arms of your father and experience his wonderful love for you, you are going to get set free. And you will lose, you will shed stupid identities. You're not an addict, you're a son. You're not a failure, you're a daughter. You're not a loser, you're a king. All these contradictions are just lies of darkness. And it just wants to destroy you. The truth is that everything God meant in Jesus, he also means for you.